to the 2023 CEPR Foundation Conference. I am Gail Harriet. I am the Executive Vice President uh, of CEPR, and this is the second of what we hope will be an annual event. Uh, the first thing I want to do is thank you. Thank you for being here. You know, I know it's Saturday, uh, and we're in San Diego. You could have slept late. You could have packed a picnic lunch and headed out to the beach, but you're here instead. Uh, you're here because you're a conscientious citizen, uh, the kind who understands that the American experiment will fail um, unless we all take responsibility for ensuring its success. Uh, you're willing to take the time to get informed about the issues. And for that, believe me, I thank you. Today, I would like to start um, by talking a little bit about the issue that brought many of the people in this room together uh, in the first place. I think of it as the CEPR Foundation's signature issue, equal treatment under the law, uh, that no one should be advantaged or disadvantaged under the law on account of their race, color, sex, ethnicity, or national origin. And in particular, I would like to talk about the extraordinary progress uh, that we've been making. So allow me to say a few words about where we have been uh, just a few years ago, uh, where we are today, and where I think we're going to be going here. Uh, it is almost impossible to believe how far we have come in just three years. In the summer of 2020, we were in the middle uh, of the campaign opposing Prop 16. Um, and if you'll remember, things didn't look so great. Uh, for those of you who, were, who weren't with us then, Prop 16 was all about deleting the following words from the California Constitution. Let me read them to you here. The state shall not discriminate against or grant preferential treatment to any individual or group on the basis of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin in the operation of public employment, public education, or public contracting. The California legislature wanted us as voters to get rid of those precious words. To put the matter a bit more pointedly, the California legislature wanted to be able to discriminate. They wanted to be able to grant preferential treatment based on race, sex, and ethnicity. For me, at least, that's a bit hard to fathom. The prohibition on discrimination had been put there um, by Proposition 209 nearly a quarter of a century uh, earlier. Uh, I had co-chaired uh, the Proposition 209 campaign way back then. So as you can see, I've been around the block on this issue. And you can understand why I was very willing uh, to co-chair the No on 16 campaign to prevent its repeal. I believe Proposition 209 reflects one of the country's core values equal treatment under the law, regardless of race, sex, ethnicity, or national origin. Uh, the alternative, a country in which fairness to individuals is ignored um, as every group battles for what it thinks is its fair share, that's not a country that anybody should wish to live in. Everybody told us we didn't have a chance three years ago. California had changed. Uh, Californians no longer wanted equality, they said. They wanted preferential treatment. They were woke. The only question was how badly we would lose. Because it wasn't so obvious um, that we could win this, that it was obvious that we would lose, many otherwise sympathetic donors um, were unwilling to give us a nickel. Um, it wasn't just that they thought they'd be wasting their money. Uh, it was actually risky for them. Um, there was no guarantee that a donor wouldn't be canceled, as they like to say. As a result, our opponents had something like 16 times more money than we had. Yes, you heard that right. Uh, it was at least 16 times. Um, but miracle of miracles. Um, it turned out that money didn't matter. Um, not as much as we thought it did. They had the big money, 
but we had the fundamental American principle uh, of equality before the law. Uh, we, the No One 16 volunteers, were relentless about getting the word out in any way that we could. Um, they had, you know, they had the big money. Uh, they had the mainstream media. Boy, did they have the mainstream media. Um, but ultimately, we had the voters. Uh, we defeated the repeal effort. And it wasn't close. Um, even in deep blue California, voters opposed preferential treatment. I'm uh, ready to know. So not long after that victory, we formed Californians for Equal Rights Foundation um, in order to educate the public about the importance of equal rights under the law. So fast forward um, to this year. And what do you know, ladies and gentlemen? This year, we have an even bigger victory uh, to celebrate, a nationwide victory. Uh, for the first time, the Supreme Court of the United States has acknowledged that the Constitution is on our side, that race discrimination in college admissions is wrong and should not be tolerated. <laughs> You all know about the decision in Students for Fair Admissions versus the presidents and fellows of Harvard College. It's been in the newspapers, it's been on television, it's been on the radio, on the blogs, on podcasts, it's been everywhere. A lot of effort went into that victory. Uh, many people contributed significantly, hundreds, maybe thousands going back over many years. But today we have as our guest, the man who had more to do with starting that case than anyone, Edward Bloom. Um, we'll hear from him a little bit later, but I don't think it's too early in the day to give him a big Southern California hand. I want you all to know that we at the Seeker Foundation did everything that we could to support Edward and students for fair admissions. Seeker's attorney, Dan Moranoff, um, he submitted a friend of the court brief that told our story, uh, the story of the defeat of Proposition 16. We thought it important for the court uh, to know that no, you know, no matter what impression that the mainstream media may be giving them, most Americans oppose the kind of race discrimination that has been routinely occurring uh, on campuses around the country now for half a century. In addition, some of us filed friend of the court briefs in our individual capacity. I filed one along with my colleague, Peter Kersenow from the US Commission on Civil Rights, UCLA law professor Richard Sander, who was an important part of the No on 16 campaign. He filed his own brief. Bad Brenbrook, the attorney who represented the No 116 campaign before the California state courts, filed a brief on behalf of Speech First. So lots of Californians uh, who were active in the No 116 campaign were there to help. Still, nobody came close to doing as much as Edward and his attorneys at the Consovoy McCarthy Law Firm in Washington. The only sad, um, indeed poignant note, um, is that lead attorney, um, Will Consovoy, he passed away from cancer uh, just a few months before the case was decided. Uh, he was only 48 years old. Um, so he did more for the future, uh, more for future generations, I think, than a lot of people do that live twice as long. Uh, so we're going to miss Will. Um, as many of you know, the Students for Fair Admissions case was originally filed as two different cases, um, one against Harvard, uh, and one against the University of North Carolina. Uh, they were filed almost a decade ago. Um, it has taken that long to get them through uh, the entire judicial process, but it has been worth it. Um, of the two cases, the Harvard one focused on the special situation of discrimination against Asian Americans. The number of Asian American students with stellar academic credentials applying to Harvard has been very high for many years now. But rather than seeing that as a cause for celebration, um, Harvard saw it as a problem. The problem of, quote, too many Asians 
Uh, so at Harvard, if you were Asian American, you had to have academic credentials that were better than those of students of other races if you wanted to be admitted. I can't emphasize enough, ladies and gentlemen, um, how counterproductive uh, it is for a nation to, to punish its high performers. The University of North Carolina case was more general, objecting to the use of race as a factor to the detriment of both white and Asian American students. The Supreme Court took them both together, uh, and with six of the nine justices in the majority, it ruled in favor of students for fair admissions, that race discrimination uh, is illegal and unconstitutional. Chief Justice Roberts wrote, um, and I'm quoting him here, the core purpose of the Equal Protection Clause of the United States Constitution is to do away with all governmentally imposed discrimination based on race. That principle, he wrote, cannot be overridden except in the most extraordinary case. Well, are there any situations where the Constitution might countenance race discrimination? <coughs> well, maybe uh, law professors like me like to bring up the hypothetical case of the race riot in a prison yard where the prison guards um, have to be allowed to separate the prisoners by race very quickly in order to break up the riot and to save lives. Okay, but Chief Justice Roberts made it clear that the case of colleges and universities uh, discriminating on the basis of race comes nowhere near uh, to that level of compelling interest. The court saw no good reason to continue the now half century long practice of allowing students from one race to be given an admissions preference over students from other races. So with that, with that case of students for fair admissions, um, history was made. Mind you, that does not mean that our country should not give a helping hand uh, to those who need it, but we should never Never judge who needs it and who doesn't need it based on race, color, sex, ethnicity, or national origin. So this is an occasion to celebrate. We have made some real progress here. At the same time, okay, here's, here's my first problem here. We mustn't kid ourselves into believing that the Supreme Court's decision is going to be easy to enforce. Uh, it won't be. It won't be. It's going to require work, 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 just like everything else in life that's worth having. Uh, we're going to need, for example, governors uh, who can appoint state university trustees who care about making sure that the law is obeyed, not just trustees who were big donors to the governor's campaign, who love getting free tickets to the big football game uh, for their university. Luckily, we're starting to see this in some states. Some governors are taking this seriously. We're going to need state legislatures willing to, wait for it, defund university bureaucracies that have dedicated themselves to circumventing the Supreme Court's decision. Um, we're starting to see a little bit of that, too, in some of the more conservative states. I'm not expecting that's going to happen in California. Um, anytime soon, but there are many states where I believe it would be politically feasible uh, that haven't done it yet, so they're going to need a little encouragement. Um, of course, there's plenty more that's going to need to be done, uh, but there's no reason to get discouraged. We can do this. Um, yes, it's true that there are a lot of university officials who consider it their sacred duty to continue to racially discriminate uh, in their admission standards. And it would be very naive, ladies and gentlemen, if we were to expect them to stop just because the Supreme Court has told them to do so. <laughs> They're not gonna go down that easily. But keep in mind, and I've been teaching at a university for a long time, so I think I get it. Keep in mind that not all university officials are true believers. A few of them actually agree mm -hmm. um, with our organization, though those that do have usually been keeping very quiet about it. Um, and there are also a few who are conscientious and want to act within the law, even if they would prefer uh, the Supreme Court case to have come out the other way. And we can work with that, that group. As for the rest of them, a lot of them just want to be trendy. 
um, fashionistas, um, I like to think of them as. Uh-oh, closer, is that better? Yeah. <laughs> I gotta have my notes here. <laughs> um, a yeah, well, a lot of them are just fashionistas. You know, they wanna be trendy. Um, and, you know, the minute that it becomes not in their interest uh, to be engaged in, 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 in admission standards that discriminate on the basis of race, the minute that happens, um, they're going to find something else to be trendy. Then there's the group that I call the time servers. They just want to get home on time for a dinner at seven o'clock. Um, and they will do whatever is the least trouble for them. So our job is to make sure that the least trouble comes from obeying the law. That means they're, yes, they're going to have to be some lawsuits. They're going to have to be some lawsuits, um, but they need to be selected very carefully and very strategically. And we need to be thinking about how to do that right now. Um, there are also um, things that we need to remember um, that are going to require uh, some work. And we have to remember that there are actually financial incentives um, that cause some of the race discrimination that we are looking at. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, follow the money. Part of the reason for the current race obsessions uh, on campus, and for that matter, everywhere, um, are financial incentives often unseen by the public, um, some from foundations, uh, some from state governments, um, some from fe the federal government. And the biggest source, I believe, is indeed the federal government. Um, and we need to be able to get that under control. We need to comb through the federal government and find those incentives. For example, federal grants and contracts are available to universities with a student body that is at least 25% Hispanic, um, but not to those with a, with a student body that is not at least 25% Hispanic. I believe that is unconstitutional um, and needs to be dealt with, ladies and gentlemen. Can you imagine if Congress had a program um, for which university had to be at least 25% white uh, in order to get subsidies. I mean, that would rightly be viewed um, as unbelievable race discrimination. Well, as the Supreme Court has shown us, it doesn't matter what race or ethnicity is being favored. It's unconstitutional. Uh, and unfortunately, we're not talking about small sums of money. We're talking about millions upon millions upon millions upon millions. And colleges and universities are falling all over themselves in order to qualify for that money. Um, and you know, we call it the Hispanic Serving Institutions Program. Um, and it's unconstitutional and it has to go. Um, then there is the accreditation process. That's another one we're going to have to start looking into very carefully. Um, let me tell you a little bit about accreditation. Uh, this is, again, something that people who are not working within the universities often don't even know about. Uh, but accreditation is important because it opens the door to federal funding. A college or university that is not accredited, and it's not just the university as a whole, but you've got accreditation for the medical school, accreditation for the law school, accreditation for, for the arts and sciences school, for all the, the, the parts of the college and university. Um, and if, you can't, if you're not accredited, you can't get student loans for your students. Uh, you can't get grants from the federal government. You know, you basically can't be a university. You can't be a law school. You can't be a medical school. It's just not possible to do it without that federal funding. So accreditors wield a lot of power. Um, and unfortunately, over the last 30 years ago, 30 years or so, quite a few of them um, have been wielding that power to force colleges and universities to engage in discrimination um, that the school may not even wish to do or may not wish to do it as much as, as the accreditor wants. There's been a lot of this going on. Um, and they're not stupid enough to get up and say, we require you to discriminate. 
And after Students for Fair Admissions versus Harvard, they're not going to put it that way. What they're going to do is they're going to say, by hook or by crook, you have to have a student body that is diverse um, up to our standards. Uh, we're not going to ask you how you do it, um, but you've got to do it. Faculty, too. Um, and there have been schools in the past that have very nearly uh, been deaccredited on account of this. Um, and these were good schools. These were schools that by no stretch of the imagination um, should they have been threatened in that way. Um, so that's one thing we're going to have to do. Uh, we're going to have to, per to, to persuade Congress um, or persuade um, a, a future Department of Education to come down hard on this. Um, but the truth is, I'm kind of optimistic about all of this. I think we can do this. Uh, it can be done. It won't be perfect. Nothing ever is. Uh, but we got a game plan. So I view all of that as good news. But one more thing I need to mention before we go on with the rest of the program. Um, the California legislature, legislature, it's back. It's back. Uh, with a new attack on Prop 209. Um, once again, they want to obliterate those words from the California Constitution. They want to be able to discriminate. Um, it's almost hard to believe that they would do this so soon after Prop 16. I mean, for goodness sake. Uh, but nevertheless, they are at it again. Uh, they just can't stop. This time, this time, the effort known so far only as ACA 7. It's a little different on the surface. Um, it seems to be different when you first look at it, but you start looking just a little bit closer and you realize that it is not really different at all. Um, it purports to simply create uh, an exception to Proposition 209, but in fact, it guts it. Uh, it guts it. The exception is going to end up swallowing the rule. Um, here's how it works. Um, ACA 7, if passed by the legislature and then by the voters, uh, it will authorize the governor of California to permit racially discriminatory programs uh, whenever a so-called expert uh, is of the opinion that doing so, and I'm quoting here, uh, would increase the life expectancy or improve educational outcomes for or lift out of poverty specific groups based on race, color, ethnicity, national origin, or marginalized genders, sexes, or sexual orientations. Uh, essentially what it means um, is that the governor can violate Proposition 209 whenever he or she feels like it. Good. One can find research to support just about anything. You know, sometimes I think that if you want to, uh, you can find an expert who's willing to say the moon is made of green cheese. Um, you know, it's, it's easy. Uh, I've got... I've, I've been in academia a long time, ladies and gentlemen. There's a lot of research out there that would make you laugh. Um, but you wouldn't even need something quite that crazy, um, you know, to gut Proposition 209. The exception applies whenever research indicates that discriminating in favor of a particular group uh, will help lift that group out of poverty. Well, just about any transfer of wealth um, will do that. Uh, I shouldn't even say just about. Any transfer of wealth. Uh, is going to count here. Um, and, you know, the only trouble is it would work usually by making, you know, everyone else poorer. Um, so, you know, how about a law that says, you know, only, only Vietnamese Americans um, or only Romanian Americans or only Mexican Americans can have jobs with the state of California or can have contracts with the state of California. That'll lift any group out of poverty, all right. Um, but it's utterly unfair utterly unfair, and the whole idea of Proposition 209 is that that sort of thing is, 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 is unfair. Why should members of only one ethnic or racial group uh, get all the jobs or all the contracts or even a, a, a specific fraction um, of those contracts and jobs? Why shouldn't it go to the most qualified person? Um, I hate to say it, ladies and gentlemen, um, but California legislatures, legislators, 
who support ACA 7, and mercifully, it's not all of them, and we got to make sure it's as few of them as possible, uh, but those who do think California voters are stupid, um, and they think we won't notice this proposal, um, which may sound nice when, when you read it very quickly um, before you've had a time to think about, hey, what's that mean? Um, it's a trick. It's a trick. How serious is the threat? It's impossible to say at this point. Uh, it's impossible to say. Maybe after students for fair admissions, uh, the California legislature uh, will decide that attempting to repeal Prop 209 in this way, um, you know, will be futile. Um, that even if Prop 209 is taken out, uh, we've still got the Supreme Court. But we don't want to take that chance, uh, not by any means. Uh, we've got to start putting effort into discouraging this, and we need to start now. So expect something in your email soon from CIFR. Uh, we got to start making some noise on this. So I don't know about you, but I am looking forward to hearing from our distinguished speakers. Um, I will, they, they will be talking to you about a number of issues uh, that we all need to be informed about. Uh, but before we hear from them, I want to thank our special friends who have made our conference possible by their generous contributions. There are eight of them, so please hold your applause until I get all of them out here. So, okay, let's start with our very generous silver sponsors are the Silicon Valley Chinese Association Foundation, Heritage Action, the California Policy Center, uh, and the Orange Club Foundation, um, and our very generous Gold sponsors are Parents Defending Education, the Pacific Legal Foundation, and San Diego Asian Americans for Equality, and our very, very, very generous platinum sponsor um, is Ivy Max. So please join me in thanking them. <laughs> 